Thank you, you guys. Thank you. That was. I hope that was as uncomfortable for you as it was for me. <laughs> the. Uh, this thing, if somebody walked by then, they said, they got some kind of choir practice every week. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Are we up? Okay. All right, we're, we're up. Thank you all for, uh, for the birthday song. Um, you know, uh, if we were going to start an all-male choir here on Wednesday, this is not, you are not the people to do it. Uh, no, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. A couple things that, uh, that we want to uh, address here on, on the front end. Uh, is I have here, uh, you know, one of the things we want to do for those of you that are not members of Shades Mountain Baptist Church, it really doesn't matter because if you're coming to this Wednesday Bible study, you now have been kind of funneled into what we're doing. And of course, what we wanted to do, and we started this three years ago, is that we wanted to, to disciple men from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity, and then that way the men can go out and be who we've been called to be and, and, and are, in, you know, through the transformation of Jesus Christ. And one of those things is to go out and make disciples, to go out and be part of bringing others to Christ. Now, there's an opportunity with one of the men uh, of our men's ministry. Uh, we have man church that happens, and we certainly want you to attend that, and we certainly want you to bring people to man church, or you can bring people to this Bible study. That's happened a lot over the last three years. But here's another opportunity. Uh, Rich Van uh, Houten uh, is going to put together a luncheon at the Inverness Country Club, uh, and it is uh, his his ministry is putting this together, and that, and what we want to try to do here is to encourage any of you that can have that day available. It's November first. I have it here on this ticket, and we want you to go find a man or somebody that is in your life, a man that you know is lost, or someone who may be on a journey. And what you want to do is just tell them, hey, I'm going to go to this luncheon, and every all this this is not a trick. And I'm going to hear, hey, Rick from Rick and Bubba is going to be speaking that day, and I wonder if you'd like to go with me. And then when they get there, I'm going to kind of just tell my testimony and kind of walk through, you know, what, what, what my life looked like that, that, you know, sadly, a lot of these men might be able to relate to. And it's, it's, it's once again using the platform of the Rick and Bubba show, using the men that are being discipled here to go out and bring somebody that maybe when they hear Bible study eh, or if they hear man church over at some Baptist church, eh, you know, but if they said, hey, we're just going to go over to the Emirates Country Club and I think Rick from Rick and Bubba is going to be speaking that day and we're going to have a great lunch. Why don't you go with me? Uh, if you're interested in that, I've got tickets up here as you leave today, uh, and then it'll have the information on here that you'll go to the website, and because uh, well, there's a cost to the lunch, and you, you just go, you wouldn't charge them. You just go in there and click in, say I'm gonna come and bring somebody, then fill out that that for Rich. So these tickets are up here. If you're interested in that, I think you could do that on November first. Grab those on the way out. Also, as we start today, we're gonna get in a word of prayer today. Uh, one of our men. Uh, uh, of course, at Shades Mountain Baptist Church, Mark Garnett, dear friend of mine, his daughter is in the hospital right now. Heather, she has a really bad pneumonia, even has a partially collapsed lung. Uh, she's at Grandview, so we want to pray for her today. And Speedy, uh, his uh, his wife, uh, they have um, um, uh, an issue in their family, uh, uh, Linda, which is actually uh, Speedy's um, uh, mother-in-law, who is, um, uh, is getting a... a, a something taken out of her lung as we're meeting right now that she does have lung cancer, but they think it is, you know, uh, only at one location and they hope they can go in there before it spreads and take that out. So let's pray over that surgery that's going on today as well. I'm sure there's many others. We're continuing to pray, pray for Bill Searcy uh, in our group. They did bump his chemotherapy to start next week. They had to do some other tests this week, uh, but of course we know we that journey w is just beginning. So I'm going to pray for these things and then we'll jump into our, our lesson today. Lord, we do lift up these prayer requests to you, all of us together in unison, are praying on behalf of our brother, Mark Garnett. Uh, we're praying for his daughter. We're praying that she, uh, her body fights back this pneumonia, that the doctors that are working with her, that the treatments will, will work and that she'll get back to full health. Uh, Lord, and we pray that you be with the family who have full trust in you. We pray for, for Speedy's family and, and the, the surgery that's going on right now with Linda. I pray, Lord, that those surgeons that are just so gifted by you will do their work and do it uh, perfectly today and that she will see uh, a long-term healing there. But ultimately, Lord, we submit to your will and your will be done. But we make these uh, requests to you. And Lord, as we now jump into a chapter of the Bible that can be quite controversial and, and too many times, sadly, Lord, in our finite minds, as we attempt to turn you into something that we can grasp or you're more comfortable with and create all these denominations and all this theology, I just pray today, Lord, that our theology be pure and it not be man-made and, and that we just understand that your word is not always uh, to, to be given to us for us to be you know, completely understand it, like we said last week, but you really gave us your word 
to be believed. And I pray, Lord, today that, that, that we'll come into this lesson with that mindset. And Lord, help me with all my flaws and all my shortcomings to be able to unpack this being filtered by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So here it is, Romans chapter 9. It, it can be uh, controversial. I, I remember our own pastor that I noticed didn't come today. Um, <laughs> when I told him that I was going to teach the book of Romans, he said, well, good luck with Romans chapter 9. And he says he's in New York or something today. But I noticed that he didn't even show up to watch me try to go through this today. No, all kidding aside, he has a conflict that I knew about. It, it looks like he's dodging this today, but he's not. Um, but, but the reason why Romans chapter 9 is very controversial is because it has divided us a little bit as a faith family on certain theology. Now, I'm going to take this today and I'm just going to do nothing but actually go through what it actually says. I will tell you some things that I don't think you can argue against. I'm sure some of you still will. Uh, but if, if, you, if today's the day that you're going to wait on me and challenge me on theology, remember it's my birthday and please don't do it. Uh, so... Uh, but I know some of you listening or watching, if you have theories on this, I certainly don't, don't pretend to have all the answers. But I, I will tell you, for me personally, taking the time to really roll through a, a chapter like this in the Bible and let God reveal what he is actually saying, I actually found that, and maybe this is just a flaw in me, it's complicated, but it's not as complicated as I've always been led to believe. Uh, and we'll talk about this because remember what we said, Theology must be based on Scripture, not concepts. And I'm here to tell you, and it may upset some of you, and, and you know how concerned I get about that, but I'm here to tell you, there, I can't find a man-made denominational theology that is flawless. There's always something in the Bible that trips up every man-made theology and every denomination that's ever been presented to me. And because God has afforded me a public platform, my emails have been riddled with all these different denominations that said if I would just understand what they know, I would no longer have to be a second-class Christian. <laughs> and, and let me tell you this. I'm going to tell you this first of all. I am sick and tired of that. And I got no interest in those kind of conversations. Because what happens with some of this denominational theology is people get this arrogant attitude that somehow they've received some revelation that you don't have. And if you just got it, you could be a first-class Christian just like they are. And I've had a number of people come up from every denomination you can think of. If you would just get this, then you'd be the real deal. But there's nothing in Scripture that says that. As a matter of fact, Scripture says that all of us seem to be called to the same standard. We seem to come to forgiveness and redemption exactly the same way. And the only thing that any of us that makes us worth anything is Jesus. And, and then you look at the things that God said to go and do, and then he says that those who love me actually obey me. So I, maybe y'all are deeper and further advanced than me, and that wouldn't take much. But I'm going to concentrate on the things I fully understand and the things that I have been told to do because I got news for you. Once I've done that, there's really no time left in my life to deal with these other things. I've got so much consumption of time and growth and sanctification on the things in the Bible that I perfectly understand. I just don't have time to sit around chasing the things I don't fully understand. But I'm going to tell you what chapter 9 is saying today based on everything that I'm able to research. And I find that some of the things that have been said about chapter 9 are flawed. They're just flawed. And we'll jump right into that. First of all, let's talk about that there's a deterministic interpretation of Romans 9, and the deterministic uh, interpretation, which I think will not stand up today. So it, some people have said that, well, Romans chapter 9 shows us that God saves who he saves, and he damns who he damns. I'm here to tell you chapter 9 does not say that. Not talking about individual people. And, uh, and we will look at that. Jesus only died for the elect, is what many says in Romans chapter 9. We'll show you that. The problem is, that's not... That's not in God's character anywhere in the Bible. You don't, you don't see that because what are you saying then? So, so what's the best presentation of who God really is and how he sees us? Jesus. So where was, the, where was that announced to the whole world on how much God loves us? On the cross. And I say that all the time. I hate when people say, I thought God loved me. Well, he does. Look at the cross. 
that if you if you ever doubt that God loves you, then you must not see the cross. That didn't he didn't have to do that. He did that because of how much he does love the people of the world. So what you would have to say is that Calvary doesn't actually reveal God, it conceals God. Does that make sense to you? If God's really weaving people in their mother's womb, some to spend eternity with him and others to be predestined damned to hell, firewood for hell, then the cross is not revealing God's character, it's actually concealing it. He's not really like he looks. There's a secret side of God that wasn't revealed at Calvary. Now, I want you to think about that. This is, these are important things to consider. Then you start running into things in Scripture. 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us it's his desire that none should perish. John 3, 16 says, whosoever. Uh, Acts chapter 10, 34 and 35, Peter says, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable for him. Chronicles tells us that God shows no partiality as far as the different people of different races and even Jews and Gentiles we find out in the New Testament. And if you want to jot some more down, I won't take up our whole time. Romans 2, which we covered, 10 and 11. Ephesians 6, 9. 1 Timothy 2, 4. 1 Peter 1, 17. And it goes on and on and on. All of these scriptures would be in conflict with anyone that says that God weaves people together in their mother's womb for hell. You would have to really throw a lot of the Bible out to believe that. And see, what happens is, so we make things more comfortable, we say, well, I'm not a, I'm not a double predestination person, I'm just a single. I just believe that he pulls out people, and, and a remnant, and, and, and those, those are foreknown, and he knows who it is. Well, no, if you're going to believe that, then you have to believe he also predestines people to hell. You can't have single, you've got to have double predestined. It's kind of like the atheists that we've had to deal with here on the show. Remember when the, the, the four horsemen of the atheist movement came out, Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and Peter Singer. I can't remember the fourth one, but I don't feel like I'm missing anything. And what happened there, see, when you're dealing with people who are atheists, a lot of times they're comfortable in that spot unless you press them. You do realize what you believe if you want to take it to its final destination. You have to believe that none of this matters. It's all happenstance. And really, if people die that you don't know, it's good because it's more resources for you. You have to believe that your daughter or your son is no more important than your dog or your horse. That's the final destination. And, and I have to say, Hitchens never would go to that final place because I think he really loved his family. I don't know his eternity. Dawkins, he'll dabble with it. But Peter Singer said, yeah, I'll go there. I do believe that. So you believe he said, I'll go this much further. I believe if an elephant is charging after a human being, let the elephant run over the human being because you don't compete with the elephant for resources. You're better off to let it kill the human because that's better for you. Well, if, if there's no God and we all just kind of erupted out of nowhere and there's no really and wrong and right and truth is relative, then why should I care about you? I understand there might be a connection to my family, but I'm not connected to y'all. I, I've, I found a connection to y'all because through Christ. You know, but if all this is just, so that's the thing. If you want to start getting into this thing that God just, there were certain people, you know, I saw one of the funny jokes about Romans chapter 9, you know, when, when we did the, you know, Black Lives Matter and all that, and somebody put out Calvinism, some lives matter. <laughs> so so if, if, if you think that's the character of God, I think it's in conflict with a tremendous amount of Scripture. And I'm going to show you this even with some of, because when we finally land today, I'm going to let you hear some things from some of our most well-respected Calvinists that might surprise you. See, I think some of this, even in Calvinism, has been taken to a place that was never intended. You know, if we want to talk about the sovereignty of God, we'll talk about that today. If you want to talk about God being omniscient, we're going to talk about that today. There's no doubt. But if you want to talk about God saying that he made some people just to be firewood in hell, that does not appear in Scripture to be the character of God. So what is Romans 9 about then? Well, I, I think that, that, that you have to understand, first of all, the issue is that the Jews are upset and they feel that God has broken His covenant with them. What remains of God's promise to the Jews now that Messiah has come? And, and you know, John talked about this in, in chapter 1, verse 11. He came to, to that what, which were His own, but His own did not receive Him. 
Now, here's another thing, and, I, and I'm going to tell you, if you're going to have a, a pure theology, remember this, if you're going to have a pure denominational man-made theology, then there can be no scripture that's ever in conflict with it. If there ever is, then your theology is not pure. And I've never had anybody be able to take this next passage and insert it into double predestination and hyper-Calvinism. Never. All they do is pivot me to another verse that we're going to explain here today. Remember, if somebody questions your theology and says, well, this verse, make this verse fit in your theology, and all you do is pivot to another verse that fits your theology, that's not a pure theology. you got to make it all fit. And guys, it could be that our finite minds, that God has revealed to us what we can handle, as we talked about before, and bites we can consume, and we're never on this side of heaven going to ever understand God fully. It could be that. This is to be believed, not always to be completely understood. So, and here is the verse, and it ties into verse 9. We see Jesus in Matthew 23, 37. Matthew 23, 37, if you have your Bible, or something with your Bible on, or you're making notes, jot this down, because this is important, because this really is Jesus already ahead of Paul on what chapter 9 is all about. So Jesus is crying. There's only a couple of, of times in the Bible we see Jesus weeping, and this is one of them. In Matthew 23, 37, and listen to what he says. He's crying over Jerusalem. He's crying over his people who rejected him. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stone those who are sent you. So every prophet has been trying to tell y'all that I am going to be Messiah. I have fulfilled the prophecies, but y'all didn't like hearing that. So you rejected them, and you've also killed those that kept coming to you saying who I am. And we know that his church is going to be attacked again. And he's crying over his people. He said, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and here it comes, but you would not. Well, now that's a choice. Other interpretations say, but you were not willing. So wait a minute. If all of this is predestined, and all this, there was no control over it whatsoever, what is Jesus crying about? Why is he saying that y'all had a choice to recognize me as Messiah? You had a choice to listen to the prophets. You had a choice to listen to those that I sent you. You rejected all that. I would have preferred to actually have you under my wings as, my, as, a, as, a, as a hen protects her children under her wings. But now destruction is coming your way because you were not willing. You rejected me. That, that'd be like saying that God made Adam and Eve so they would sin. That God made Lucifer so he would become the devil. Well, that's not in God's character. And then the people say, well, who are you to say that you can reject God? I'm not saying that. I'm saying God, because he wants to receive glory, allows us to make choices. And he's certainly sovereign. And he's certainly omniscient. But predestina predestination to hell or to heaven just is not supported throughout Scripture. It may be dabbled in in certain parts of Scripture, but it isn't supported from beginning to end. And it's not going to be supported in Romans chapter 9, as much as you may be led to believe that it is. So that's where we find ourselves. So now Paul is dealing with the Jewish people in Romans chapter 9. And boy, he starts out with a statement that is really unbelievable. If you have your Bible or something with your Bible on it, we want to start looking at what's going on in, um, in Romans chapter 9. Does the Jewish rejection of Messiah now relieve God for fulfilling His promises to them and disqualifying, disqualifying them from grace? You know, the question here is much bigger. The mere, the mere historical interest is, is supremely important. If God promised the Jews, uh, and, and now it's been canceled, might His promise to those of us that are on the other side of the resurrection and the Gentiles grafted in, does that mean His promise to Christians might also lose its validity at some point? Would He just change His mind? So this is an important question that Paul's dealing with in, in chapter 9. Paul seeks to answer, and this is good, by probing the character and purposes of the omnipresent and the omniscientness of God. He concludes that God accomplishes His purpose in history through sovereign choices and that His sovereign freedom is guided always by His mercy. Can you follow that? Picture, if you will, and it's a little bit flawed because the, the plane could crash. Take that out. Take the plane could crash out, okay? Because in any, any analogy we come up about God's going to have to be flawed compared to Him. 
I may run down here to the Birmingham airport today and I booked a flight to Houston. I got no say on our destination. Once I sit in the plane, the plane's going to Houston. And I have nothing to say to that. But now while I'm on that flight, I'm making all kinds of choices that are allowed me. I'm choosing what I want to eat or not eat. I'm choosing whether I'm going to engage with the person next to me about Jesus or not. I choose whether I'm going to sleep, whether I'm going to stay awake, whether I'm going to read a book, whether I'm not, whether I'm going to listen to music. I'm making all kinds of choices, but I can't do anything about the destination. That's in somebody else's hands. And what Paul is saying is, if you want to look at God being sovereign, he uh, certainly is, but if you want to look at God pre having predestiny, this involving, is involving his choice of nations, bloodlines, all of this, it does not have anything to do with individual people being condemned or being re re redeemed before they're ever born. And that's what he's trying to make us see because he's dealing with some Jewish people that are kind of saying, where do we stand now? Is God's promise to us broken because we rejected Messiah? And what is this about grafting in the Gentiles? Are they in now too? And we had the law. We tried to keep the law. They didn't. You've got to explain this to us again. So Paul says, let's go to Romans chapter 1, 1 through 5. Paul's sorrow for Israel. And man, you talk about strong statements. He said, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. Now think about that. He said, I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. He's saying, the Holy Spirit has inspired me to say this, and you need to listen to what I'm saying because it's truth. And here's what he says, that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Now think about verse 3. Anybody that thinks that, that Paul has forsaken his people has never read Romans chapter 9, verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Y'all realize what Paul's saying right there? If I have to go to hell for you, I will. I would rather me lose my redemption than you lose yours. This is how important what I'm saying today is, brothers and sisters. This is how much I love you. I love my people, and I love my people's relationship to God. And if I could save you by me not being saved, I'd do it. Anybody relate to that? I mean, can you think about, do you love somebody enough that you say, send me to hell, but don't send them? And that's what Paul is saying. That's a strong statement. He says, they... He said, my kinsmen according to the flesh, meaning I am one of you. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, worship, and the promises. Five, to them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Paul will forfeit his own salvation to gain salvation for his people. And I just put by that, wow. But verse 5 is important, too, because he goes on saying, I understand the history of my people and all that God has done through us and the promises he's made. He's even brought the lineage of the Messiah through us as promised. But here's what he's making clear that you don't want to miss in verse 5. And it says that this may be in the Bible. Think about all the th times this is mentioned. The clearest reference to Christ as God in the entire New Testament. Look at 5. He says, to them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. You know what he's saying? He's God. This Jesus, when he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and, we, and you tore your clothes, and we all screamed and hollered and screamed blasphemy, I'm going to tell you, as a fellow Jew, he is who he said he is. And Christ is God over all. Amen. So let it be true. That is a very bold statement. Now keep in mind, he's talking to Jewish people here. Don't lose sight of that. Verse 6, the children of the promise. This is 6 through 9. And then he goes on. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. That's important because they're saying, so what happens to us now? For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all are the children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This is important. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what he promised when he said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. 
Now, why, why is this important? Rick, what is he talking about here? Paul is singling out that Abraham has natural children, Ishmael. He even had a few other children with another servant that not talked about a lot. And certainly they're Abraham's offspring, meaning in the flesh they are his children. He says, but the descendants of Isaac are the children of the promise. He didn't make a promise through Ishmael. He didn't make a promise through the other children that Abraham went off, that, that Sarah and Abraham worked some other plan outside of God's will, or Abraham was sleeping with these other, he, had, he also had more than one wife. Now he's having children with other women, and he says certainly they may say that Abraham's their daddy in the flesh, but they're not the children of the promise. He said because God's promise has always been that the lineage to Jesus will come through Isaac. And, the, and those that are descendants of Isaac are the children of the promise. The others are just Abraham's children. Now, here's the problem. Now, some people will take that in theology and say, well, that's what he means by he's already predestined, who's children of the promise and who's not. That's incorrect. There's nothing in Scripture, nothing in Scripture, that tells us that Ishmael was condemned to hell. You actually see an angel going with him and his mother and taking care of them. You don't see that Abraham's other children were condemned to hell. You don't see that at all. All you see is that God says, my sovereign choice was the lineage. And that's not going to change. But it does not say that Ishmael, even though nations came from his lineage that we're still at war with today, and they claim they're the chosen people, that's not, that doesn't mean Ishmael felt the same way. I mean, Ishmael didn't create Islam. That was something that came after that. Ishmael is Abraham's son in the flesh, and there's nothing in Scripture that says, and because Abraham listened to Sarah, and he had a baby with his maidservant, and his name was Ishmael, that kid's going to hell. It doesn't say that at all. It just says that his lineage will be Isaac because that's what he always intended. And that was something that he decided before Isaac was born. And we'll see the same thing happening a little bit later on. That, that, see, that's two different things, and you've got to understand that. And, and, um, and, and so Paul begins to discuss God's purpose in history, and frankly, he doesn't talk about eternal damnation at all, as some would want you to believe. Remember, double predestination means before the foundation of the world, God determined who would be saved and who would be damned. And, he, and, that, and here's what, I love this line right here. The problem with those that have taken this and turned it into double predestination, it seems to be imposed on the passage rather than rising from it. So that's what human beings do. Be real careful about that. This theology seems to be forced on these scriptures as opposed to just sitting back through the Holy Spirit and let it rise from it. It's being imposed on it. And you've got to be careful about coming up with denominational predest I mean, denominational theology that we force on Scripture as opposed to listening to what Scripture is actually saying based on what the whole Bible says from beginning to end. If you look at Romans chapter 8, we talked about it last week. The predestiny we see talked about right there is the predestination that believers will come to glory. Those who, who, who submit to Christ, those who are re re reconciled with Christ, he says, I guarantee you that you'll become more like my son if any, everything in that was sincere. You'll see that we'll talk about today that what he's talking about, look at Ephesians. Ephesians say believers are assured that they are chosen or predestined to be for the praise of God's glory. So what are we chosen for? To be the praise of God's glory. You never find scripture Pre, with predestiny being used in a negative sense. Think about that. That's important. Because if this theology was to be believed in its purest, wouldn't you think somewhere in Scripture we would see some reference that predestiny is being used in a negative sense? It never is. It's only used in a positive sense. Predestined to glory. Predestined to be like my son. It never ever says, and by the way, some of y'all are predestined to hell. It never says that. You would think if that's pure theology, it would be mentioned somewhere. It never is. It's always used in a positive sense. So that should, that, that should be a signal as well why we have to look at this on the grand picture of the Bible, not in little tidbits that we impose something on. Romans 9, 10 through 13, God's purpose will prevail. Romans 9, 10 through 13, look at 10. And not only so, and here comes a biggie, which we're going to talk about, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, 
had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of the works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now I will tell you that just about every conversation I've ever had with someone who believes in predestiny, now they've never told me they, they believe in the double predestiny because I guess that's uncomfortable, but they believe in predestiny. If you bring up Matthew 23, 37, that Jesus said that Jerusalem had a choice, they'll pivot you over to uh, Esau I hated, Jacob I loved. They don't explain how Matthew 23, 37 fits into Calvinism. They won't do that or predestiny. They just pivot you to one they think does. Again, you can't have a pure theology unless you make the entire Bible fit into your theology. If at any point it runs aground, there's something human in it and you've messed up. Or you may just not understand God fully. Could be that. So let's talk about this. So what we're talking about here, first of all, what did Jesus say when he was talking about what it looks like to follow him? He said, anybody who truly follows me must hate their mother, must hate their father, you know, that, and, and so does you think that means that Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you condemn your family to hell? No. If you look at the Greek, it doesn't mean hate like despise. It means preferred. When the word in Greek means I prefer this over that. It's preferred. It's not damnation. You think Jesus really wants you, if you really want to be a follow him, your whole family's got to be damned to hell? What he's saying is don't prefer your family over me. If you really want to know how to treat your family, then you prefer me first, then you'll be what they need to be anyway. He doesn't say that you, your, your family's condemned to hell or you can't follow me. Well, this is the same word that is being used here. And what is he saying? Just what I said before. He said, before these twins were born, my lineage was going to go through Jacob, but we're going to go through Esau. This is me preferring what will become Israel over Edom. The descendants of Esau were the Edomites. Now, we also, once again, do not find in Scripture that because God said, and He told Rebecca this, and I just got through teaching this. I think God was preparing me for this. It really just came up randomly that that's what I taught at church uh, uh, two Sunday, uh, not this past Sunday, but the one before. So He tells Rebecca, the younger one will be served by the older one. But Rebecca didn't have faith enough to just let that happen, so she goes in all this trickery and deception to make this happen, when God said it was going to happen anyway, and He told her that, He said, now we got problems. Now you've recreated earthly repercussions. Well, how can earthly repercussions be created if all this was predestined? There shouldn't have been any earthly repercussions. So Rebecca had a choice to try to deceive Isaac? Or did God plan that too? Well, God says He didn't plan that. Well, why'd she do it? Maybe it was her choice. And maybe God allowed that choice because he wants to see if you truly trust what he says. And he comes back and he says what? Back to what Paul's trying to tell the Jews. He's going to fulfill his promise in history concerning the nations and the lineage. What he's doing is trying to get them ready to reassure them God has not abandoned his plan for you. It's just now in Christ. And yes, the, yes, the Gentiles have been crafted in. and Y'all going to have to learn to deal with that. But what he's showing is God has always said, I'm in charge of the lineage. I'm in charge of this, and I'm going to do it through Isaac, and I'm going to do it through Jacob, and I'm not going to do it through Ishmael. I'm not going to do it through these other children that Abraham had when he wasn't supposed to. And, I, and how about this? But that does not mean that he predestined Esau to hell. There's no scripture that says that. As a matter of fact, what do you see? Esau comes back and reconciles with his brother. You, mean, you know that part of the Bible's in there too. So they don't remain enemies. Now, those nations start warring against each other, their descendants. But you don't see Esau. Esau comes back to Jacob, and Jacob thinks Esau's going to kill him. And he comes and he grabs him, he holds him, and he begins to kiss him on the neck. And they forgive each other. Where, where do we get that Esau was predestined to hell? He just wasn't the lineage. And he never was going to be. That was not his role in history. It had nothing to do with his eternity. And that's where the problem is. And this word hate does not mean damnation. It means preferred. I prefer Jacob for the lineage over Esau. And you know what that means? God knows what he's doing. For whatever reason, Esau was not the right lineage. Does he give us the answer for that? He hasn't. I know that Esau had a problem that some of us can relate to. He sure did like to eat. So much so for a, for a bowl of stew, he gave up his birthright. 
That's loving food, by the way, extremely. So what I'm saying is, and also we know what, but Jacob was a deceiver. His name meant to deceive. And Rebecca deceived. You never see anywhere that Isaac doesn't forgive Rebecca. And you know what else you don't see? Guess what happened with Jacob? He wrestled to get his blessing, and God changed his name to what? Israel, the one who struggles with God. So he's no longer a deceiver, but he still struggles with God. And even though he was given the blessing, that old angel still took his hip and knocked it out of socket, and he limped the rest of his life. Always a reminder of what happened so it would never go away. So when you see people try to tell you that the Bible says that Jacob went, was, was, was uh, in heaven and Esau was sent to hell before they were ever born, that is not what this says. It's preferred for lineage and for nation against nation and for history and God's sovereign history, not individual human beings being condemned or redeemed before they were ever born. That is not what this says. So what do we say next? So we move on, because you, you will deal with that a lot. It says, uh, they both were legit in the line, but God chose one over the other uh, in the womb, setting up. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was, how about this, another thing, and this is what Paul's making clear in verse 12. He says, God did predestine and was sovereign over both of them that legitimately could have gotten the line. As a matter of fact, Esau was born first. By, by, by Jewish rule, he should have gotten it and was going to get it. But God was going to work that out anyway. But it also says what? Neither one of them in the womb could say to God, well, we should be lineage because of our great works. They couldn't do that. It, it, and it's why he's telling, you know, why is he telling the Jewish people that? Because they think that righteousness comes from works. And he's showing them it, did, it, didn't, it didn't for Jacob. He certainly didn't have any works to show for it. It was God saying, as far as the lineage is concerned, I make that decision. And I'm going to fulfill my sovereign choice, and I have every right because I'm God to do so. Nobody can question God. We'll get to that before we're done if we don't run out of time. And, um, and he said the reason God makes choices and acts in history is so that his purpose will stand. And again, this is not talking about people's uh, salvation. It represents two nations, Israel and Edom. He, he, the love-hate means preference with regard to purpose in history, not that people in each group are either saved or damned. Just because you're an Edomite doesn't mean you're damned. Just because you're an Israeli doesn't mean you're saved. Romans uh, 9, 14 through 18, God's justice and mercy. 14 through 18. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on uh, human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Now once again, these verses are being used. Well, there it is. This couldn't be clearer than that. Well, actually, you're right, but, but it also isn't clear exactly what people have imposed on it. Because if you look at the, the history of this, Paul antip, anticipates a question that he thinks that the group must have, because I would have it if I was listening to him and I was Jewish. Hey, is God unjust? Hey, Paul, is God unjust? And so he says, I know y'all are thinking this. So what he does, he quotes Exodus 33, 19. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have a compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now, Pharaoh is always one of these things people use that, that, that try to take this theology and make it work, even though they're ignoring uh, Matthew 23, 37, and 2 Peter 3, 9, and uh, John 3, 16. But so we'll go into all this, and they say, well, it clearly says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, right? But how did his heart get hardened? By his disobedience. Every time that God came before Pharaoh and said, let my people go, he could have. That's important. He could have. And why did he use the hardening of Pharaoh's heart to glorify himself? I didn't know this for a long time. I only discovered this in the last five years of my walk. Every single plague and curse that God brought down 
on Pharaoh and the Egyptians showed that the gods they worshipped were powerless. Now listen, stay with me. This is big right here. So they worshipped all these different type gods, and every curse represented one of those gods. And it showed that these gods they created could not compete with the one and only living God. You know what else he's doing to Pharaoh? I'm trying to get you to believe in me. I'm showing you that I am the one and only living God. Now, there was a point that Pharaoh rejected and rejected and rejected. And it says that God then hardened his heart. But he didn't harden his heart in his mother's womb. He hardened his heart after he kept rejecting him over and over and over. Pharaoh could have let those people go and says, I recognize you as the one and only living God at any point. And he was trying to show him, not out of condemnation, but out of mercy, to say, Pharaoh, can't you see who I am? And Pharaoh kept rejecting him. Those people, those people could have been let go on, on plague number two. Number one, he's trying to... So you'll see that when God hardens somebody's heart, it's not he hardened their heart inside their mother's womb. The people's hearts, including the Jews, became hardened in their disobedience and their rejection of God. And I'm telling you, every one of us should be thankful that we never got to that place. I can certainly remember being close. As, does, does, does God draw people to him? Yes, he does. And I'm here to tell you he was trying to draw Pharaoh to him. God, God always offers the plan of redemption. He, he used the hardened heart to reveal his signs and wonders, but also to give Pharaoh a shot to stop what he was doing and see that God truly was the only true God. 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. When, when Paul is talking, perfect example, you remember this, we've talked about this. Paul's talking to the church at Corinth, and there's a man in the church body claiming that he is one of the members of the church body, claiming he's been reconciled to God, and but yet he's having this sexual relationship that Paul says is so dark and twisted that pagans don't even do it. And what most of us can figure of what Paul's letting us see, this man was sleeping with his dad's wife. It'd like be to sleep with your stepmom. Okay? And Paul says what? Turn him over to Satan. Why? Listen to his exact quote. Hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a New Testament Pharaoh situation. No, no, no. Don't, don't keep trying to be gracious and merciful to this guy. Let, let it get so bad for him that he'll actually be saved. Turn him over to Satan. Because the worst thing you can do for him is just keep justifying it and keep allowing him to blaspheme God's church. It might be if he faced the wrath of God and the, and the attack of Satan, he'll turn and be saved on the day of the Lord. So you don't, you don't see anything there. What if Paul would have said, well, obviously this guy's not one of the elect, then just, just throw him out and we'll see what, you know, it's obvious he's not one of us. Do you know I've never met a person who believes in double predestination and doesn't believe they're part of the ones going to heaven? Never. <laughs> I remember James McDonald, who's come to speak to us in January at Man Church. He has a daughter that was wayward for 10 years. And he was lamenting and praying and trying to get people to help him. And one time, one of his Calvinist friends, you know, very loving, said, have you ever thought your daughter's not one of the elect? So the friend he was telling that to him says, what did you say to your friend? He said, I looked at my friend and I said, I sure am glad you're not my father. So your kid gets a little wayward and suddenly you go, well, maybe they're not one of the elect. Now I've never seen anybody who believes this theology that doesn't think they're one of the elect. Never. Now if you want to see somebody stick to their guns, for somebody to say, I 100% believe in this and I'm not one of the elect, I'm doomed. And I was doomed in my mother's womb. Have you ever met anybody that believes that about themselves? It is convenient that everybody who believes this thinks they're in. And so, so in this particular case, we're seeing examples that that doesn't quite seem to go with the way chapter 9 has been presented to us. The question, if in resisting God's will, 
is, 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 is the, the person who's doing this only acting out a role which has been determined beforehand, well then how can that person ever be held morally responsible? If the person who's misbehaving, like this guy in the church at Corinth, if he had just said, well, this is just the way God made me, how can y'all hold me accountable for my immorality if this was predestined in my mother's womb? God did this to me. Anybody prepared to say that to God? What have we been saying in here? What the Bible seems to say is what? Don't be like you are. Don't be like you were born into your sin nature. You've got to be reconciled out of that. And everybody, everybody must be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Everybody. Whosoever. It's his desire that none should perish. I wanted to protect you from what you're doing, but you were not willing. And certainly, Pharaoh had an opportunity to recognize God for who he really was. Romans 9, 19 through 21. Now in verses 19 through 21. You will say to me then, what does he why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? You've heard that before. But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? What we just said. Look at 21. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump of one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Now this is another area where you see this being, being somehow imposed that this means that you're either doomed or not doomed before the foundation of the world. The question is, is in resisting God's will. The rebel is only acting out of a row which had been predetermined beforehand, right? And, and, and I, I, what he says when he says, who are you to talk back to God? I love that. Paul's always balanced. He believes in the importance, of, the importance of human moral responsibility, but knows that God's omniscient will has the ultimate value. He says that God has absolute power. However, the power is expressed through mercy. Paul's understanding of God's sovereignty is not that of an inflexible, arbitrary determination. The right of the potter is in verse 21. It's not naked indiscrimination power, indiscriminate power, but power used by a benevolent will to accomplish good that he wills within the order which he created. Now that's deep. I want you to stay with that again. What he's saying is he's acknowledging that God's in control and he's acknowledging that God is the potter. And he's acknowledging that God can do whatever he wants to do. But what he's saying is, but you find that in God's character, his desire always comes from a benevolent place, and certainly he will pour out his wrath on sin. So he says what God is really saying in this as a potter, and they understood this because they saw it everywhere in their culture, he's saying the right that he has is not just some naked, indiscriminate power, meaning, how about I'm in charge, and I, it's, I'm just throwing it, I'm reckless. It's one of the things, gosh, I, I'm going to get in trouble. There's a particular hymn that is really popular right now, and a lot of it is really, really good. I don't like the word reckless in it, because God's not reckless. His reckless love, he's not reckless. He, he, it's order. I don't like that lyric. I wish it would be removed from the hymn, because there's nothing reckless about God. He is not reckless. He's not out of control, and he certainly doesn't call, fall victim to emotions like we do. He's always in control, and when he says that I am the ultimate, I use my power through my benevolent will to accomplish good that I will, but it'll always be in order for how I want things. That again, it's not mean. That means that hey, some of us have been created by God to do perfect. Perfect example: Billy Graham is no more important to God than the shoe salesman that invited him to the tent revival. He created the shoe salesman to be a shoe salesman, but his role in the kingdom of God, not by human standards, we don't see the, the shoe salesman as important as Billy Graham because we're not going to do statues of the shoe salesman and all that. But that's us. That's not how God sees it. The potter says, over here, I made a shoe salesman, and over here, I made an evangelist, but you watch in my perfect created will, I'm going to put these two together. Now, Billy's going to have to make a choice within my perfect will and within my sovereignty and the shoe salesman is going to have to make a choice. Is he going to do what I called him to do? 
And if he does, it'll bring me glory. And if he'll do it, I'll have Billy Graham at the perfect moment. I will have his heart pierced. He will accept that invitation. He will go to that tent revival. And somebody comes and says, did Billy make a choice? And God will say, yes, he did, because I allowed that choice. Did you know what was going to happen? You know what God says? Yes, I did. <laughs> Is that okay? Y'all are trying to make God something you can understand. You know what? You're, we're trying to make him answer to time. He doesn't answer to time. He is time. Amen. I'm the beginning. It's a terrible analogy, and it is so low compared to God. It's like a parade. I can't see but what's coming by me. But God says, I can see the beginning of the parade, and I can see the end of it, and I can see the middle of it all at the same time. God can see Adam and Eve falling and the return of his son the second time all at the same time. I can't. And all these little choices that we're allowed to make are simply to bring Him glory. Why would He say go make disciples if it doesn't matter? Why? Why would He say how can they believe in something they never heard and how can they hear if they don't have a preacher? Well, I would just say, well, I thought you got all this worked out. And you can say what you want to say. You can say, well, I believe this theology, but I'm still going to do what God told me to do. And I think that's great. But I know human beings too well. And I've been in conversations too many times. When you start thinking somehow you're more special than somebody else in God's eyes, it breeds arrogance. And when you start thinking it doesn't matter that God works it all out, it breeds apathy. It always will. And I don't care what anybody says about that. It will. Human beings tend to say, you know, I should go do that today, but it doesn't really matter. It's all been predetermined anyway. You say, well, no, the Bible says we have to do it. Nobody can argue with that. You're right. But there is a different mindset. And I remember talking to somebody one time who says, you know, when I was, in, I was riding in a car in California, and I passed a person. We made eye contact on that road, that, some famous road that I can't remember. And I thought to myself, I wonder if they're one of the elect and how special it was that I was. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So it doesn't breed arrogance at all. Um, God ordains people for various purposes. I made that clear. Noble and common, certainly. But heaven and hell, absolutely not. Different purposes, noble, common, absolutely. We're all not made for the same role in the kingdom. But predetermined heaven and hell, I don't see it in Scripture. 22 through 24, God's wrath tempered by His patience. We're getting close to being done. I'm hurrying to get us out here on time. This is a lot to cover in an hour, and I understand that. So he says, um, 23 through 24, he says, In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. See, now Paul's finally getting to it. And indeed, he says in Hosea, he wants to, you know, the prophets already said this, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who are not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. And we'll, we'll get to that here in just a minute. So what's happening here is that he's saying the present result of God's wrath and mercy has been the establishment of the Christian church. And this is where you find true predestiny that, that I think is biblically sound. He prepared in advance for glory even us whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. What he's saying is, if you want to talk about predestiny, the church was predestined. God, were, God knew that the church was going to be predestined. It would include Jews and Gentiles as the hardening of Pharaoh resulting in the manifestation of God's power. Listen to this. On behalf of Israel, the hardening of Israel has resulted in a manifestation of mercy by including the Gentiles into the elect community. Ooh, you follow that? He's saying, if you want to see the way Pharaoh hardened his heart when God kept telling you this is the deal or kept telling him, he also said to the Jews, this is Messiah. Jesus said, if you've seen the Father, you see me, I am the prophesied Messiah. John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And because you rejected that, just like Pharaoh, you have become hardened. But in God's mercy, he's now taken the Gentiles and he's grafted them in to accomplish what he's going to accomplish. And now they're part of it 
through his mercy and will, and you're still part of it, but now everybody's on equal ground because whether they were given the law or not, they've become righteous through Jesus Christ. You think you can become righteous through works and the law. You're wrong. Jesus has fulfilled the law. So if you want to see God's plan to bail us out, it's still his grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. And now we got the church. And he had that plan all along. This is not about individual people. This is about God's history. The community of believers, the church, was not a fluke. Both Jews, Jews and Gentiles are part of it. And you know what? God called it. And all may come. All may come. But all must come through Jesus. All must come through Jesus. Paul now begins to quote extensively from the Old Testament when he did this with Hosea. Look at 27. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay, as Isaiah predicted. If the Lord of hosts has not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. And he goes on to say, when finishing this up, he's saying, Paul's quoting from the Old Testament, only a remnant of Israel is called into the church with the Gentiles. God's grace and mercy kept Israel from becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah. Paul, he says, I hope that that remnant is a temporary state of affairs. And you'll see in, in, in Romans 11, Paul says the remnant was temporary. He's going to call all of Israel back to him. He said, but right now, so that it didn't go away, he said, your rejection was so severe, if God had not in his mercy pulled a remnant out, those of you that have already become part of the church and you've recognized uh, Jesus as Messiah, if, God, if that had not happened, Israel would have ceased to exist and would have gone the way of Sodom and Gomorrah. So he pulled a remnant out to be part of the church so that Israel would not be doomed and would not be eradicated from the earth. And you know, he says that's again... His mercy and Paul's prayer is this is only a temporary state of affairs. And y'all realize we're still part of that. Of more and more people coming to Christ, including the Jews. And then Romans uh, 9, 30 through 33, the stumbling block, the stumbling stone. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued the law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching the law. Why? because they did not pursue it by faith. They thought it was works. But as if it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put into shame. The stumbling stone. Surely nothing was more difficult, I love this, for Paul to come to faith than for him having to recognize, as he's asking them to recognize, that he crucified Messiah. And he's acknowledging that. Y'all going to have to just get past the fact that in order to become part of the church, you're going to have to come to the conclusion that we crucified Messiah. We did. And I would say that to you and to me. It don't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. If you, if you want to get to the point where you're finally redeemed, you've got to come to the conclusion that we were so sinful that we crucified Messiah. People say, who crucified Jesus? I did. Who crucified Jesus? You did. People ask me all the time after, did you ever get mad at God about what, what has gone on with your, you know, with your, your family and with your, your son? I said, no, I tell you what I got mad about is sin. My sin, the world's sin is so severe, babies have to drown at two and a half years old for God to try to get some things done. Babies drown in a fallen creation. People die, people get sick. Think of all the things we're praying about now. And I don't get mad at God about that. I get mad at sin about that. And he says, this has been a stumbling block for us. We can't, we know to recognize Jesus as Messiah, we have to also acknowledge we crucified him. And he's saying, that was tough for me, and I know it's tough for you. But you got to get over it. You got to get past it. So I certainly, in closing, I certainly don't want to say that I have figured out all the theology, and I certainly don't mean to be disrespectful to any theology. I really don't. 
And if you said, Rick, what is your theology? I, I will tell you, I don't fit. I don't think any of us do. I don't think there's a denomination that's man-made out there that's got it 100% right. Because there's something in there that people got to arguing about that made them go over here and say, we're going to have our church that believes this, this, and this. You don't find denominations anywhere in the Bible. You see Jew and Gentile, and that's it. And you see Paul and all the others trying to say that goes together in one church. Don't get caught up in all these foolish arguments that Paul said that are going on out there among denominations and theology. It's foolishness. I'll read you this before we go. Charles Spurgeon, who, who would, would maybe disagree with some of the things we talked about today to some point. This is him closing out one of his sermons. Many of you are saved. I beseech you to intercede for those who are not saved. Oh, that the unconverted among you may be moved to pray before you leave this place. Breathe an earnest prayer to God, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, I need to be saved. Save me. I'll call upon thy name. Join with me in the prayer at this moment. I entreat you. Join with me while I put words into your mouth and speak them on your behalf. Lord, I am guilty. I deserve thy wrath. Lord, I cannot save myself. Lord, I would have a new heart and a right spirit, but what can I do? Lord, I can do nothing. Come and work in me to will and to do of thy good pleasure. Thou alone hast power, I know, to save a wretch like me, to whom or whither should I go if I should run from thee. But now, do from my very soul call upon thy name, trembling yet believing. I cast myself wholly upon thee, O Lord. I trust the blood and righteousness of thy dear Son, Lord. Save me tonight, Jesus. Save me. Now, he may be a Calvinist. And he may believe something that, I, that I'm not sure that I would fully be on board with. But when you hear that man closing out his prayer, he's closing it out like everything depends on the decision of those that are hearing him preach. And he certainly didn't walk out of that room and say, God's going to work it all out and had it worked out before you were ever born. He's being obedient to what God called him to do regardless of his theology. And as long as we can land in that place, why don't we focus on the things that we've all been called to do that no denomination can get around? And if we get to heaven and God says to me, Rick, you didn't have Romans 9 right, I don't care. And if those who disagree with us get there and say, you know, everything y'all are doing, certainly I draw people to me and I save everybody, you don't, but everybody made a choice that's here. Who cares? Why don't we just do what God said to do? Because you know what? He's going to reveal to us all we can handle. If I know everything about God, then he's not that impressive. But I do know this. I do not think any denomination can say that their theology is pure. None. And it may just be that none of us can fully understand God. So that's when we trust him. And we let him make us into be new creations, and we do what he says to do. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this message. Thank you for, Lord, hopefully clarifying some of this for us. I pray, Lord, that if there's any error that, uh, that I committed against you, please forgive me. And I pray, Lord, that you will continue to work in the hearts of all who are hearing this. And, Lord, I pray that you protect me from foolish arguments and protect each of us from engaging in conversations that do not bring glory to you. I pray, Lord, that ultimately you'll be glorified and that we'll present you to a dying world. And, Lord, I pray that you continue to reconcile us in a way that transforms every single inch of our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys.